What's up, gangsters? It is a cold and blustery February day out here at Rube Goldberg Enterprises, and quite frankly, I feel terrible. But this is one of those days where I just can't uh, not accomplish something. So you know what happens then? I make a video. So yeah, that's what's happening. And this is timely. This is a video about a topic that uh, I think and hope um, may help some people. Um, it, it's something that I see quite a bit, and that is uh, guys having difficulty getting good, smooth, uniform paint finishes. And so this uh, video is about spray discipline. Now, that term may immediately confuse you because you may be thinking, what the hell is spray discipline? Does that mean someone is going to come along and smack me on the back of the head if I'm doing it wrong? Well, I don't know. It might, <laughs> that might not be a bad thing. That might make some of us better painters. Uh, I don't know, but that's not uh, literally what it means. Spray discipline just really is just kind of a generic term that covers um, all sp airbrush spray um, technique, if you will. I, I hate to say that, though, because, you know, real airbrush artists use a lot of techniques that are designed to create specific effects, and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the basic, the basic fundamental thing of spraying, just laying down color, just you know, turning your model from red to green, whatever it is. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Not special effects, just the basic stuff that you need to be able to utilize every day over and over to get a good quality paint finish. And kind of what inspired me was a video that I was watching on uh, the old YouTubes the other day. And uh, when I tell this story, this particular YouTuber is going to know that I'm talking about him, but don't get bent out of shape. I, this is, you know, this guy's a really good model maker and his, and his YouTube channel is good. Um, but he was laying down some uh, aqua gloss, which if you don't know is uh, all clads acrylic clear. And he was laying down some aqua gloss on top of a very nice bare metal finish that he had done. And he was commenting that he had had some trouble in the past with aqua gloss because uh, his enamel weathering products that he had used on top of it had eaten through it and damaged the paint. And that immediately caught my attention because I was like, what? Aqua gloss is basically bulletproof. Uh, you could practically, you know, take a part covered in aqua gloss and dunk it in mineral spirits and nothing would happen. Um, okay, don't try that at home, kids. Uh, but anyway, it is pretty bulletproof stuff. I mean, it's, it's my go-to... Uh, uh, sealer for anything that's going to need a lot of abuse. Um, and um, I know from experience that you can put mineral spirits based uh, weathering products all over it. So then I started watching what he was doing. And I noticed that he was just kind of waving the, you know, he's waving the airbrush around, spraying a little here, spraying a little here, just, you know, kind of sort of wandering all over the place. And I was like, aha, I think I understand the problem. Um, what's happening here is that even though it may look like it's a, a, a uniformly thick layer, um, it probably isn't, especially being as difficult as it can be to see on a metallic finish. And I think that probably the diagnosis for his uh, issue was uh, not that the enamels were eating through the aqua gloss, but that he had areas of uneven coverage that were porous enough that they were allowing the enamels to go through and hit the paint underneath and then cause the problem that, that he saw. And I see this all the time, particularly with people applying clear coats uh, where they are. They're just waving the airbrush all over the place. And granted, there are times when that's fine, but then there are times when you need more spray discipline. So that's what this is about. Let's go. All right, hopefully this will work out. Everybody knows that I suck at doing stuff on camera, but maybe I can pull this off. Um, I cannot do something like this in my spray booth, however, because it's just way too much noise and it annoys everybody and I don't want to come back and do uh, an overdub afterwards because lazy. So, as it happens, I need a paint mule to test some colors 
uh, and I need it in Steinal Res Rust Base. So I've got my squeeze bottle of my custom mix here, uh, which is just uh, black and uh, the uh, orange rust Steinal Res mixed together in a way I like. And I've got my uh, airbrush, uh, uh, my Iwata HPTH with a .5 needle because it's the best thing I have uh, for spray and Steinal Res. The stuff is, uh, you know, kind of thick, as people who have used it know. So that 0.5 millimeter needle works good. And I've got my compressor set at 30 PSI, which I know may freak some people out, but that's just how it is with Steinal Res. It, uh, it, it, just, needs some, it just needs some horsepower behind it. So I've got these uh, pieces here, and I think these are, are a good place to, uh, to demonstrate what I mean when I talk about spray discipline. So, let's just talk about the basic thing of needing to apply a very uniform coat of material. Um, and, and the times that you might want to do that are um, priming, for example. Um, you want a nice even layer of primer all over everything. Um, a color coat on like a car body, for example, where you know you, everything is, needs to be completely uniform. Um, or a clear coat. I mean, a clear coat is, is a great one, whether that's uh, a matte coat or a gloss coat or something in between. Ideally, you want nice uniform coverage. And the thing to think about, uh, in my opinion with that, is if you ever watch a professional car painter do their job, you will notice that they spray in a very particular way. And it's something like this. Let me make sure I'm on camera here. Now, they may not spray that thick and wet and get, you know, a bunch of runs like I just did. That's one of the hazards of using Steinal Res at 30 PSI is that it will uh, start out looking crazy uh, like you've done a terrible job. See, like that. Uh, look how, how gross that looks. But just watch. By the time uh, this is done and it's all dried out, you'll be amazed at how much it's leveled itself out. At any rate, that's the basic spray discipline for getting an even coat. You want to start somewhere off of the piece, make a pass that's just nice and steady speed across, clear off the piece, make your turn, come back, make your turn, come back. and. Um, you obviously you, you need some overlap. Um, if you spray like this and you've got too much distance between each pass, well obviously you're not going to get a nice even coverage so that's going to sort of defeat the purpose. The other thing that you will always notice with, with uh, guys that are paint, you know professional car painters is that they uh, work to keep the airbrush perpend or the airbrush spray gun, whatever it is, perpendicular to the surface. All right, and the reason for that is simple. If you spray straight at the thing, you get a round spray patch. So it's pretty much even coverage all the way across the diameter of that spot. Uh, I mean, obviously, this coverage gets thinner as you move to the outer part part of, of the spot, but still, it's, it's a gradual fade on all sides that's equal on all sides. Whereas if you're holding it at an angle, you get something like this. Well, that's when you pull the trigger too hard because your airbrush is clogged up. <laughs> That's one thing with Steinal Res, it, it, it has a tendency to clog up uh, pretty quickly. And the nice thing about this 0.5 millimeter needle is I can just rake my thumbnail across the tip of it to clean it off. Anyway, hopefully it'll go better this time, but you'll see, you see what I'm saying here. If you've got the airbrush at an angle, you get this elongated spot which means that you have heavier coverage here at the front of it and lighter coverage over here at the back of it. 
and you can get some overspray. And overspray is the bane of a smooth uniform finish because what you have are little droplets of paint that have taken longer to reach the surface and are more widely distributed and so you get these basically little tiny microscopic boulders that are laying around everywhere and that obviously is going to create a rougher finish. It's not just an issue with something like a primer but with something like a clear gloss it definitely is. And this is where you see uh, uh, spray discipline or lack of really show up is when somebody's trying to get a really nice gloss finish whether that's with gloss paint or with uh, with, with, a, with a clear gloss because every little bit of that relatively dry overspray that lands somewhere on your surface uh, whether that's on the surface and then you come back and paint over it or whether you're landing little droplets on top of paint that you previously laid down that's, that's already wet those little droplets are what's going to create that roughness so the idea is to maintain as steady um, a position, as, a position as, as steady an orientation and, uh, and speed uh, as you possibly can. One, another way to think about it is if you, if you consider uh, like in a, in a car factory, you've got robots that are doing the painting and the engineers decide how much paint they want on a particular car body, what thickness of paint and because they know what the volumetric flow rate coming out of the uh, spray gun is uh, they can basically do some calculations and decide uh, based on that um, how close they need to be spraying from and how fast they want the robot to travel while it's painting and obviously because it's a robot it's going to be very precision in its movements and it's always going to be the same and so you're going to get that nice even uniform thickness. Now obviously none of us are as uh, precise as robots but you know it's kind of fun to think of it that way when you're painting and you're trying to do a real uniform color coat. I know that for me when I just think about that it helps me remember to always maintain a constant speed and position and get good steady overlaps. So. Alright, so obviously how fast you go and how close you are is going to have a big effect on how much paint you're putting down. And that gets into whether or not you're spraying wet, normal, or dry. Okay, those are terms that tend to confuse people. Like someone will say, hey, I'm getting bleed underneath my masking tape. What do I do? And the answer is, well, spray drier. But, you know, people kind of get confused by that sometimes because they're like, well, what do you mean spray drier? It's paint. It's wet. Well, let me, let me show you what that means. What I just sprayed there was what I consider a pretty normal way of spraying where I'm, I'm spraying just at what I kind of, I, 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 I don't know that this is a good term for it, I kind of just made this up. I call it the dry line where basically you can see that as you're laying the paint down you can see that it's wet But it's drying almost instantly. Like you can see just while I'm talking about it that it's starting to dry. So that's kind of what I consider to be normal spraying. Now wet spraying, obviously, that's what happened when I got all heavy handed over here. Okay, that's obviously a gross exaggeration of anything you would probably ever want to do but that's wet spraying. You can also see what I was talking about with Steinal Res. Look how much that stuff just leveled itself out. I mean, it's why it's such a great primer. Um, okay, now what about spraying dry? Well, if you want to spray dry, 
you can see here that there's basically no sheen of wet paint. So if the thing that I'm trying to do is lay down a, cons a, a consistently thick opaque color coat, but I have masking in the area, well, this is kind of the trick. You spray dry, but you do, you try to spray dry anyway, but you spray more layers. And you kind of sneak up on that on that opacity that you're looking for without laying down so much paint that it's able to seep underneath your masking tape. So that's what 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 uh, what people mean when they talk about spraying dry. Now, obviously, you can do that as well by moving further away. If I come way back here and I like double my distance. That also is a way of spraying dry. And some people will use that, like when they're spraying something like aqua gloss, if they want it to actually be a little more of a satin finish, or maybe even actually have a texture, then you can back way off there and spray really dry, and you can see what you get out of that. You may have, you know, that, that will help you get a slightly less glossy, uh, finish because the thing that makes something gloss is that the paint is wet enough that while it's drying or flashing off it has time to flow together and all of the paint particles kind of join in a big hand holding ceremony that makes them completely uniform across the surface so that's the differences between uh, wet spraying, dry spraying, and what I call normal spraying. So now you say, well, but look, I don't always want to spray a completely uniform coat. What about if I'm black basing or I'm doing a military vehicle that has, you know, worn and faded paint and uh, I don't really necessarily want the, a uniform uh, layer of paint. Well, absolutely. There are times to break the rules and that's, and, and what we're, what we're talking about there is definitely one of those things. So if you're black basing, then obviously all of that spraying uniformly, pretty tough to black base at 30 PSI, but all of that spraying uniformly just goes totally out the window because that's not what you're after. And so you're obviously not making uniform passes all the way across the surface of your model or going at the same speed or necessarily even staying at the same distance. But even if you're spraying a really small area, like let's say I'm trying to just zoom in on something like a, a, a flap or an aileron, still maintaining good spray discipline even though it's a relatively small area. And notice how close I'm spraying from. Obviously sometimes that can get away from you, but again, I'm trying to show something that you would do with normal paint <laughs> using a pretty thick primer at like three times the pressure. But point being is that sometimes even if you're spraying small, you still can utilize that basic spray discipline to get good even coverage. Okay, but now you say, well, what happens if uh, I have, um, you know, like an actual thing, like a real model, and it's not so easy as it is when you're demonstrating on camera, Pattison, because, you know, it's not always just this open flat surface. Sometimes you have like real shapes and things you have to deal with. Well, yes, obviously you do. And one of the challenges with stuff like that is uh, this situation in particular, where you've got the wing root on a, uh, on a model airplane. Uh, if you use lacquers in particular, you may have noticed that you'll get dusting in, in areas where you've got like a, a corner. And what I mean by dusting is that you will get a, gran a granular look, like little tiny pebbles uh, of texture 
all over the surface. It's basically the same thing that can happen from spraying too dry, which means too fast or from too far away, but even worse. And what happens there is that if you use the basic spray discipline that I've talked about of going perpendicular and spraying slow, what happens is that you get little particles of paint that basically start, I don't know, ricocheting around in this confined space. And so they have a little bit more time to dry and they land funny and they pile up and they make these weird textures. So there's a couple of ways that you can reduce that. One is to use something like Steinol Res because this stuff is, I mean, one of the reasons why it's great for uh, like armor models. Um, like I, I've used it here on this piece. This is a machine and Krieger kit. Uh, and whenever you've got nooks and crannies that you need to spray around places like this, where a lacquer primer might do that dusting effect, Steinol Res is really, really forgiving in that respect. So that's one thing you can do. Um, I think acrylics in general tend to do less dusting, but if you're like me and you love lacquers, what do you do about it? Well, the thing is, again, to look to your spray discipline, but change the rules a little bit, because what you need to do is give the air an outlet so that it's not just trapped in between the airbrush and the surface. So what I try to do is spraying small, do a quick needle clean here. I love that about this airbrush. Anyway, so you gotta spray small, but you also need to spray at an angle because now the paint particles, if they are gonna bounce, they can escape out this way rather than just ping pong and back and forth in here. So we're totally throwing the rules out the window. and just working it like that. And it doesn't really matter which direction you go, but you can see that you've given your paint kind of an escape route so that you don't get that uh, granular effect. But for the most part, you should still be able to use good spray discipline even on something like this. Wow, that thing's got a lot of texture on it from <laughs> past testing. This mule has uh, definitely, as you can see, gotten lots of use as a, as a practice piece. Probably about time for it to take a bath in some brake fluid. But it's really good for this sort of thing. Now, another thing that a lot of people will talk about is orange peel. And orange peel, you know, with gloss, it's just a thing. Uh, and you can prove that to yourself by going out and looking at your car. Um, in fact, uh, there's, there's a, a kind of old uh, body shop wisdom that says, if you wanna know if a car's ever been repaired, just look and see if it's got orange peel because more often than not, factory paint is gonna have some orange peel, whereas if it's been uh, painted and, and definitely if it's been polished, it may have less or a different sort of texture of orange peel. But what orange peel, peel comes from is from having to spray wet. And you can see it if I really just lay this down thick like that. You can see basically the orange peel just sitting there. Now the good news obviously with this primer is that that's gonna level out and go away. But in a gl clear gloss, um, whether it's an acrylic or a 2K clear urethane or whatever, you have to be careful because that's not gonna completely disappear. So you have to spray wet with gloss, uh, uh, but 
not uh, not so wet that you get runs and, and, and you get just a ton of orange peel. But that is kind of basically uh, a good rule of thumb, uh, you know, when you're thinking about how to spray different types of paint. The glossier you want it, the wetter you need to spray. All right, uh, I think that kind of, I think that covers it. I think that basically amounts to everything that I wanted to say about this. I know that this may, you know, that this may seem like an elementary thing, but, uh, you know, it is, it's, it is a thing. And hopefully uh, this will give you some insight if you have not been satisfied with your paint finishes. Okay, there you go. I hope you guys found that useful. Um, I know that uh, a lot of uh, a lot of you guys, if you've even bothered to watch this far, are gonna be like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, I know this stuff. This is just elementary. I don't need to know this." Um, well, all I'm gonna say is that based on the amount of rough paint that I see in pictures uh, on Facebook model making groups, not as many of you know it as think you know it. Um, I, rough paint is just, it's just everywhere. And uh, particularly shocking to me is how rough some of the stuff that's supposed to be glossy is, uh, car models in particular. Um, and, and, and to be fair, I think maybe, um, you know, sometimes maybe people aren't seeing it. Um, you know, literally, they're just not seeing it because maybe their visual acuity is not, not that great. But I know we've had a lot of people who, uh, you know, once they've been in Scale Modeler's Critique Group for a while, have said, you know, once I started taking uh, more close-up pictures and posting them in the group, I was amazed at uh, all of the goobers that I saw in my work, in particular how rough my paint was. Um, because it's not necessarily a thing that you're going to see uh, with the naked eye at a normal distance. I mean, I know if I don't have my readers on and I'm looking at a model that's this far away, I'm certainly not going to see... Um, what you know some people might call a minor texture but I build my stuff to be photographed up close and it sure as heck shows when I get in there with the camera so again um, this is just one of those things where if you've just been dissatisfied with your paint finishes or you've had problems with your paint things that you might not immediately associate with spray discipline maybe it's something to consider at any rate, as always, I just hope it was useful, and uh, I appreciate you watching. Take care. Much love.